Okay, recording. I was much not to forget that because that's something that I would do, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, I didn't forget. So there it is. We're recording. Um, okay, so it is 11.30. We have people who are kind of getting on now. I'm going to give you just a few extra minutes to get on. Those of you who are coming into the um, webinar, if you would please go to the chat feature. If you go up top of your screen and click on that green button that you see and just click chat if you don't already see a chat box, just um, put, it, uh, put a hello, who are you? It, um, send it to all participants so that we know who's here, which, which um, instance, and I'm doing that so that you have a chance to use the chat before we get into any um, or questions so that you'll have that functionality. So if you wouldn't mind doing that real quick, that would be great. I'm going to give us one more minute, and then I'm going to go ahead and get started, give more um, time to sign on. And hi, Sandra from Front Range. Thanks for doing that. Barb from PCC. Hi, Jill from PCC. Glad you're here. Hi, Kathy Pellish. I know who you are. And all participants was not there. Oh, okay. Well, maybe. Hmm. Did you scroll all the way up? It says um, all attendees, all panelists, all participants. You should have gotten that one. Panelists does send it to a limited number of people, but that's okay. I mean, it's it's. I will see them, so um, um, not uh, might not be shown there. So where it says send to. And then currently mine says all participants. There's a little bit of draw down there, and you can throw it in. No big deal, just if you can. Hi, Paul, Ray, Rolly. Hi, Shauna. It's fine if you don't see all participants. What I'm going to be doing is, as I'm able, and Holly Schmidt, hi. As well, I'm going to answer some questions, but I'm really um, focusing on a lot of content today. So I want to make sure that if you have questions, you put them into the chat. I can see them. I see what you're doing. So just go ahead and put them there. And if you have any concerns um, that I haven't gotten a question from you today that you wanted to get answered, um, you can put into the um, you to uh, an email and feel free to send that to, to me. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and get started. And I'm going to just say um, welcome to to everyone as you continue to sign on. Um, today we are going to be talking about um, prior assessment credit. And what I'm doing today is, is a very of an introductory um, an injury session for Colorado. Some of you attended the PLA 101 that we did a while back. Some of you have been part of other types of things that we've done, and you've learned quite a bit about PLA. And what I'm doing here is really doing a major update on, um, okay, uh, I just had a note from Jack that he cannot hear me. Jack, did you call in on the video call? I'm not on the computer, so you'll need to dial in to be able to hear. Um, I'll have another way I can help you with that. Um, make sure that you've dialed into audio. You should be able to hear from there. And um, if you need that, if anybody is having that same issue, if you go up to the top of your screen, you click on audio connection options, and you'll say, you'll say I'll call in, and we'll give you the numbers to call. Call. Go ahead. Um, let's see. Today, what we're going to cover is, and this is a, a quick agenda for you, we're going to talk about the process that we went through to develop the PLA credit system, and that's what we're calling it. It's really a um, kind of a, a, a mixture of um, some changes in um, policy and some changes in procedures and some changes in thinking that we'll try to um, push out to all of you guys. Um, and then some procedures the, from the manual, and, and which is in development, and we're going to talk about the manual and what the next state of development is, which is going to be getting it out to all of you for review. Um, talk about the dashboard, which is a new tool that we're building, uh, like credit crosswalk matrix, developing implementation plans with some suggestions and some of the pieces and parts of the resources that have already been put in place for you, and then next steps. So that's the, the agenda for today. I want to talk about is really about where we came from and where we went. To. We started this process because of the CHAMP grant, Colorado Health Advanced Manufacturing Programs, and there was thing in the CHAMP grant, which is true for 
all of the tech grants that we've had in Colorado that was for a different track outside of the whole manufacturing area that had to do with um, the focus area was credit for prior learning. And what we were asked to do, and it was a very short, very simple goal in the grant, it said redesign the current Colorado Community College system model for credit prior learning to accelerate certification. And what they did was kind of open the door for us to have some resources to be able to um, start looking at our, our current practices into what we could do to make them better. And that's really what our entire goal was and it is. What we did first was we assembled the Credit for Prior Learning Committee. And that committee um, met for well over a year and we officially disbanded. I'm, I'm uh, asking them to um, manual along with the rest of you and then we'll probably end up meeting again to go through um, talking about what else we need to do or change or, you know, as, as we go forward. But we met in um, very diverse group of people. We registrar, testing specialists, vice president, deans, transcript evaluators, some faculty. We had an expert from Yale who sat with us and helped us with developing the policy. We had most of the people who came were from the CHAMP grant, and we didn't have representation from every college, and that was primarily because we wanted to be able to, to support their travel and their time um, so that their colleges could pay for them uh, for that for them out of the CHAMP grant. So that was part of the reason. The thing too is that I sent out um, invitations to all of the institutions, and these were people who were going to be able to have the time and make the commitment. In February of this year, we forwarded um, policy revisions to the credit, what used to be known as the Credit for Prior Learning Policy to the State Board, and they approved those on February 13th. The systems document, uh, the systems procedures document, if you're aware of how that works, is usually BP board policy and SP system procedures in um, process. It's almost finished. It's actually um, in the hands of the legal team here and then will be approved by our um, provost and will be then in place and published. And then also working on credit crosswalk matrix, which is in development. We have a portion of it finished, the standardized test mix, and the rest we're working on. So that's kind of the process of where we've come from, where we've been. The changes specifically, and this is one of those things that's important to make sure that everybody has a sense of this. We didn't change pieces of the policy, and I think that it's true that some people weren't aware of the first policy with original policy. Um, it's been kind of a of an operation in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of people aware of it. There were not a lot of people at most colleges. We did a survey with Kale um, before we started this work to ask about people's level of awareness about PLA on their campuses, about who does it, how is it done, you know, how does it benefit people. And the, the level of understanding was not very high. It was pretty grounded in the registrar's offices in terms of the people really knew what was going on. And then depending on the institution, it might have been run out of an advising office. It might be a transcript evaluator who was doing it. There was a very much a, of a, a broad So first of all, we changed the name of the policy to Learning Assessment Credit from Credit for Prior Learning. And that was very purposeful. What we're after is a shift in culture that takes away from this idea that someone is earning credit, you know, or, or you know, this, um, this idea that the credit is the thing that in, and that the student can, you know, kind of in effect buy credit. And that's been a a huge misperception as long as this is around, but to take the shift away from that and to really emphasize the understanding that what we're looking at is assessing learning. We're not looking at giving things away. We're looking at assessing learning and for um, people who have the information and the, the knowledge and the understanding that they need and the skills to be able to pass a class at our institution, they ought to be able to have an opportunity to um, show us that. And so we're talking about assessment as opposed to just the idea of prior learning credit. Um, the um, uh, policy requires a student to take one credit in residency, which means they could be registered at your institution and they had to take that one credit with you in order to have their transcripts or have their credentials um, assessed for credit that they were in the institution for at least a semester before they were allowed to have that credit assessed. What we found as a, pro, as a um, group and what we learned from our research is that that actually is a huge disincentive for students who might be inclined to use credit prior learning because what they're after is I start in a strong way or is it worth my starting in this place because I have all of this knowledge and information um, they want to find out. You know, typically they start the conversation with, I wonder if what I've been doing for the last five years, ten years is worth anything at the institution. And essentially what we were telling them when they walked through the door is like it might be but you have to come to school for a semester before we'll tell you. And that was a disincentive. 
Um, and also for a lot of the students who take advantage of this, it's a difference between I'm going to come at all or I'm not going to come because they don't have a strong self-efficacy that says I can be a college student um, as a recruitment tool. We found from the research that it's a huge incentivizer for students to say, um, sure, you can come to college. You already have X credits because of what you already know. You're, you've already begun, and it's a, a big incentive. So we took the one credit, credit and residency away. Um, we have across institutions. We have across institutions. This is still in place, and it's in the process of being shifted. But, but we carried costs. The only rule that applied to was that um, costs for assessment or costs for credit for primary had to be less than 50% of the tuition cost per credit. Everybody complied with that, but there was a broad array of charges from relatively little to a free um, balanced idea of, you know, the, the cost was associated with the relative layer and that kind of thing. And the big thing that we found about that is that many of the colleges that resist using this or doing this feel that it was cost um, prohibitive. And when we looked deeper into that, we found out that they were often the ones who weren't in any way trying to use the um, money that they could generate through the assessments to actually pay for the process. And so we've looked a lot at that, and what we came up with and put into the policy and what was accepted was that we have a system-wide cost matrix. And part of my um, efforts in the spring will be to work with colleges on building a financial model around that. How do you take the money that you can earn through um, assessments to help support a system? It's not going to support it 100%, but it's also not going to be the same as it was in the past where it was not any kind of a line item cost for an institution, and typically it was labor on the backs of someone who took it on as an extra duty. And what we're is making it a, a, a wide open duty that some is actually compensated for, including faculty who do assessments and people who do the record keeping and all the rest of it. I um, looked at a set, the old one was assessment practices varied by college, colleges. Essentially, um, you know, with all the best of intention, colleges were duplicating a lot. Um, for the same types of credentials, uh, colleges have varied um, um, protocols in place in terms of how somebody might be assessed for prior learning. Some of them are very strict and they have a lot of rules. Some of them have very few rules at all. Here, let me talk. Let, me let you talk to this faculty member. So we looked at that and said, you know, that needs to be standardized across the state to some extent. One, one of the biggest role, roles within um, the group was to find the balance between some standardization that made information open and accessible to the students and not an excessive amount of local control because what you do in your institutions is what's valuable to those students. So we, we tried to strike a balance in there. And so what we looked at were assessment practices in terms of um, best practices, what are national best practices. And there are not a lot of quote unquote rules attached to this. There's a lot of recommendations and we're also looking at certain pieces and parts that make it more standardized for students. And then we looked at training for assessors, that we ask people to be um, following a particular protocol when you need to be able to train them to do that. And then so the handbook, the current handbook, or the, the past handbook with the policy, it had been updated a number of times. It was very specific to that current policy, and so of course it had to be updated because the policy was updated. And then it also had, um, it was pretty much the, the credit matrix um, was mostly standardized, or it was all standardized testing. Um, the information um, was have been updated for quite some time, um, and it was time for that to ha happen. Essentially, what we ended up deciding about the handbook was is we needed to put it aside altogether because we needed to shift our thinking into this idea of, of uh, creating a system that created efficiencies for institutions, allowed institutions to offer this as an open service that students could be recruited through, um, and there would be an incentivizer for recruitment and for retention, um, and also to um, efficiencies that would allow people to not have to continuously duplicate. So we had a goal in mind around those ideas. So the PIM procedures, which is the other document that I told you that is currently in legal and it'll be done for us probably by the end of this week. First piece of it, we talk about publicizing PLA credit opportunities. So we put it into the procedures that it needs to be something that's more open. If you've gone on your own website, and, and maybe different now because we've been talking a lot about this in, in the last six months or so, but if you went on your website and you Google on your website or did a search on your website for credit for prior learning or prior learning assessment or credit for work knowledge or anything like that, depending on your institution, depending on um, your services, uh, if you were the student trying to find those things, you might or might not find anything. Um, you find some, some information, essentially a lot of institutions just took the procedures manual and copied it there, which was 
uh, I think a good effort, but it's not the procedures manual wasn't written for students, it was written for practitioners. So it didn't necessarily give students an easy way in. I think one of the big things about that is that we, we as a system have made it very difficult for students to access this opportunity. Um, we bit it under a lot of things, we buried it behind a lot of things, and we resisted it in, on many levels because of the workload involved. Very understandable in terms of you know an unsupported activity that that uh, you're not going to go out and publicize something you don't even have a person whose name is the responsible person for totally understandable. Part of what we looked at was getting out clear, concise information to students that it's accessible, that it's it's headed toward new and currently enrolled students, and we really um, get to the place where we're meeting the intent, not just letter of the Student Bill of Rights. So the Student Bill of Rights says that a student has the right to challenge any class. And what we did was we said, okay, that's fine. If you can find how to do it, you can have it. And being facetious, but the, it was difficult. Uh, so it was there, a student could challenge the class, but we certainly didn't make it very welcoming. So we're with the intent of that law, not just the letter of the law. And then we, we um, looked at standards for awarding credit, and that's the next thing that's in the procedures. We looked at college level learning and skills. There was admission to a program of study. So a student has to declare a major of some sort. It's not, um, they can't apply um, any prior learning assessment credit to, um, just to pull in any prior learning assessment credit without a, a program of study. They have to choose something. Um, that the credit for courses is directly applicable to the declared program. So maybe that it ends up in their elective block for a, a associate's degree, but it has to be directly applicable. And then meet or exceed C level work by whatever credential they're bringing forward. And anything that is assessed, including portfolios or if we do any crosswalks, has to be assessed by a subject matter expert. So um, it's a typical practice now for um, transcript evaluators when they have something new come across their desk to talk to a faculty member. We're trying to kind of take that up a notch and say that that faculty member needs to be able to be responsible for that to the extent where we can say, yep, we agree that it's um, crosswalked to a CCNS course. We're going to put it out for the world to see so that we don't have to continuously duplicate that effort. So it has to be subject matter experts. Awarding credit um, are still the same. Pretty much we added one thing. So they're standardized tests, CLEP, Dante, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, CLEP, IP, AP, and the rest, and I have a more list later on here. Institutional challenge exams, as you've, you've been doing those for quite a long time. Publish guides, which is the ACE guides, military and workforce. Um, there's an, also another one that's in the matrix called NCCRS that we use not very much, but it's one that has been there before, so we kept it in the policy. Um, multi evaluated local industry and workplace credit is something new that we've put out here because a lot of this actually is already happening, but we want to normalize it to a certain extent so that we can track it and share it. And portfolios, which you've all um, had experience of. And the um, thing that we, is in the procedures is the, the establishment of a PLA credit crosswalk matrix. We only have a matrix that shows all of the standardized cut scores in the course crosswalks, and it's very good. That was in the past policy. It was in the past handbook. We've updated that significantly, and that particular one was a little bit different than um, one of the other things. But what we did with that one was um, took a look at it, first of all, and found out that, that we actually, as a system, only um, accepted about 30% of the tests that were out there that students could take in high school. Typically, it was high school students, um, AP and IB, and the cup was um, to high school and non-traditional students. But we did the um, to, we would accept for crosswalked credit to 30% of the general population, and by that I mean um, all of the four institutions: CSU, CU, Mines. And so we did. Um, we proposed to the vice presidents. Um, Council to say what we would like to do is to mirror um, the offerings of the larger colleges. It didn't make sense for us to not accept things that something like CSU, CU, and Mines would accept. And I put together a matrix for them to look at in, the, in comparison. And what they agreed to was that any standardized test, IBAP, CLEP, um, that was accepted for Xbox to GD Pathways courses. Any of one, any two of those three colleges, CSU, CU, and Mines, would put on an interim matrix for us. And I call it interim matrix because CDHE, the Department of Higher Education, is currently in the process of developing a statewide um, standard test matrix, which is they're telling us will be delivered in the spring. Um, and in the interim, we decide to go ahead with this to let students who are coming in this year get take advantage of it. So we increased our offer 
offerings by approximately 70 tests. It was very welcomed by um, the high schools and by um, school counselors. I think they did a little happy dance when they saw they were doing that because we really, um, we were disincentivizing students who had an extreme degree who would be excellent students for us to recruit. So I changed that. And then in terms of posting credit, what that's going to work is that the student is admitted with a declared program of study, so they fill out the admissions form, they're in the system. The PLA credit is not counted toward any FTE. It is identified by a specific course number and semester credit hours, so there's no opportunity for any kind of duplication for the student over time. It goes into their transcript as a course with credit hours. And they have to produce required documentation if there's a credential involved, if there's a transcript involved. They have to produce it and it's kept by the college. Um, in terms of the cost, we're going to stand to the cost matrix across the state. The student bear reasonable cost of assessment, and that's a common practice. Fees are charged for posting of credit, which has also been part of our common practice. They exceed 50% of the cost of tuition for credits awarded, and it is non refundable regardless of assessment outcome. The student will request an assessment. If they say what you gave us didn't reach a college level, they don't get their money back. There won't be any kind of conversation around that because the funds are for the cost of assessment. And it is very possible that that will happen. One of the things that we're trying to um, push out as a best practice is that if a student comes in with something that needs to be assessed, if they have a portfolio or they have a, a transfer, transfer credential from a non-accredited institution or they have something along those lines, and the person who's evaluating it looks at it and says, well, you've got about half of what you need. You could maybe put together a portfolio to show us if you have the understanding and the knowledge and skills that you need for the other half. So you could combine credentials if you needed to. But no matter what, the student, um, the person has to provide some form of a, um, of a credential, and then there's no, um, there's no refunds for the cost of assessment. And then transfer credit, PLA credit must be accepted or transfer among all states system colleges, and that's new, um, that the credits apply to the degree or certificate program at the institution the student is entering. It used to be that institutions um, within the system reevaluate students when they come in for various reasons, and what we're saying is that the students are being assessed against the common course numbering system. If a team member has decided that what they have is an equivalent credential, and they give them that credit, then that credit counts no matter which institution they go to in the system an important thing for students. They don't need to shop around and find out, will you take my credit? If it's awarded by a faculty member at an institution that's part of the system, then it counts no matter where they go. Transfer as an articulation agreement shall include information on transfer of PLA credit. Um, Thomas Hartman is working on a lot of those, and we're trying to inject a statement into every one of those that says uh, that, you know, actually that we have this system of, um, we have the system of prior learning assessment that um, exists and that students may have earned it by that way, and then to give them a little bit more information about what that, is, that system actually entails to build some trust around that. And right now, there are institutions that are going to accept our credit pretty broadly and, and are pretty happy to do that. There are others for your institutions that will stop students at the door with any kind of credit, credit for prior learning. Um, at the state level, this whole um, the work that they're doing on prior learning assessment right now, first of all, is the standardized testing, and then they have Propose forward for a new statewide prior learning assessment policy that's pretty reflective of what we have. They will have been working with us as they started their process. But what they're looking at is taking it piece by piece. First, the standardized testing, and they're going to look at things like published guides and portfolios. But the big thing within that proposed policy is a requirement of all four year institutions to accept credit, PL credit, no matter um, how it was earned, no matter what the method of assessment. That we say they earned this credit, we put it in a transcript that they would accept it. And that's going to be a big, big step. We'll see how that kind of turns out. It's going at a very slow pace. Um, in the meantime, what we're looking at is really building up confidence and trust in our own system that they can they know that, that a student who's been assessed for credit has met all of our standards, who has done all of these things, and to build trust between the institutions that we work with. So as you're building agreements, that that kind of, that be part of the conversation. And the matrix. So the matrix um, is going to be our core data um, piece. And in the past, the matrix has been a PDF file that's been updated um, occasionally and posted out on um, the CCCS website to give people information about um, what does actually crosswalk or what credentials or tests or whatever that might be crosswalks to which CNS courses 
or what the equivalency that they could earn would be in our matrix included standardized test cut scores and standardized test crosswalks. So that's continuing to be there. We have that. that we're currently using the interim standardized test um, and it'll be replaced by whatever they deliver from CDHE. I'm pretty confident that what they're going to come up with is going to be pretty darn close to what we have. And actually what I'm hearing is that uh, some of the cut scores are going to be lower than what we've currently on our um, got our uh, matrix because of the way that the data is showing how those students perform as they get into college, which is where they're really looking at this. Does a student with a three um, on a test perform better than a student with four? And what they're finding out nationally, um, thousands and thousands of tests, is that no, actually they, they don't perform better. They perform as well. Um, so, or they don't perform, uh, the, the, the threes and fours are relatively equal across the board. So there's a, a, a big push at the at CD to, to get that score where it's more accessible to more students and because they want to lower the standard, but because the data is showing that those students perform as well as the students with a different score. Um, we'll replace that standardized test one. We're also on this new matrix going to include challenge tests by course and institution. And what it's going to be is just an informational um, opportunity for students in terms of searching for information. So what we're going to, we, we, many of you may have already seen it, we sent out a survey to all of the institutions, and we sent it to multiple people at the institutions and asked you to tell us courses do you offer challenge exams for. Um, and what we're doing is putting all of that information together in this matrix so that if a student says, I need to challenge Math 121 and I live in the southern part of the state, is there a college near me that will allow me to take a challenge test and they'll have that information at hand. And that way then they have um, well, they don't have to be calling your advising office asking that. It's, it's readily available, and I'll tell you how it's going to be available. But um, we felt that that was important for that whole idea of transparency and being open and welcoming and using this as a recruitment tool. We'll um, make sure that that uh, information is available to the students, advisors, and staff. Um, we're looking at previously evaluated published credit, uh, credit recommendations. So that, that is, is things like AC and um, um, kind of an evaluated um, credit that you've looked at. So primarily it's going to be ACE, and I'll give you an example. So school A gets a student with a transcript that says that it's an AC transcript, which they can ask for. Students can um, order an ACE transcript from ACE. And that says that they have a credential at work, a work credential that they've provided that um, AD has uh, recommended is equivalent to credits in um, intra business and you're going to look at is or what our institutions have looked at over time is okay well let's look at what ACE's um, you know recommendation is for that particular credential and they can look at that on the website um, under the ACE guide and it'll say, this is what we looked at these are the assessments all of the things that the ACE group looked at to assess that course and then our subject matter expert can say yep that looks good to me I agree that that's an equivalency and then what they would do then is is, uh, is give the student the credit for, you know, BIS 115, for instance. And so what we're doing is, is trying to start to gather the information from institutions who have taken particular types of credentials or who have taken ACE recommendations, have already evaluated them and crosswalked them to CCNS courses, and to put those into a common platform that will allow the rest of the institutions to look at them so that they don't have to consistently evaluate and reevaluate. And that's you know, it's turning out to be a pretty big task, which we kind of anticipated. There's two different ways that we're looking at that. There's the military, and then there's the other um, um, ACE recommendations for workplace learning. So they it creates a lot of information. Colleges have have um, traded more credit under this particular heading than on any other. Um, by you know, we did a just a real quick kind of a data dump on what we are actually transcripting in PA, and this, this was one big dog. After is reducing duplication of work, creating some efficiencies that make this a more attractive activity for the institutions, um, and then um, getting some transparency for students that I can come with my credential to one school and I can come with it to another school and I'm going to get the same recommendation from either one of them is what we're after. And this is, this is also flexible. We're asking for this information to go into the matrix. Nobody's required to put it in there. We're after we're after making this a more efficient system to stop duplicating effort. 
It gives students a much more transparent opportunity to know what they might be eligible for. The other thing we've added to it, which it hasn't been there before, is faculty evaluated local industry and workplace crosswalks. We're seeing a lot of this through the CHAMP grant. We're seeing a lot of this through our past um, TAC grants from the COTEC grant that um, industry partners that we work with will say to our institutions, and typically our CTE programs, our people go through this level one, level two, level three supervised training and um, supervised apprenticeship or whatever that might be, and we think that they've learned enough that they could, you know, earn credit for some of the courses you offer for that associate's degree. We'd like to see what we can do about that. So faculty members then will go into the, to the industry and look at all of what they're being taught, look at what they've learned, look at their um, methods of assessment, supervision, all those things. Say, yep, you're right. We would give anyone who has that level three certification from you 12 credits in machining. And I'm, I'm throwing out just very generic uh, examples that are real, so don't worry about those. But something, for instance, if somebody is working in industry and has a NIMS certificate, what does NIMS certificate equal in um, our institutions who, who offer that? And can you say reasonably that if they've earned the certificate, then they've earned the credit for the courses? And that's where we ask faculty again to let us know. You've evaluated this. You let us know. We get it into the matrix, and the person who has the exact same credential or that exact same training doesn't have to go to, um, doesn't have to go anywhere to have it reevaluated, and you all end up having to do the work again. So the way we're going to facilitate this is also being funded through the, the grant. And currently, it's being called the dashboard. And I'm open to any kind of suggestions for names if you can come up with them, because I'm under the gun to name this thing, and I'm not sure what we're going to call it. It's an interactive tool for students and advisors. It's primarily forward facing for outward facing for students. But we have systems built into it that will allow advisors and registrars and anyone else actually to get into it to get the information as you choose. What it's going to be is built over the matrix. So the matrix is the data source. And students are given this very easy one-click um, link on your web page. And we've been working with your, your uh, marketing folks on that. I'm putting it on the front page. It might be something like, um, do you, have you had a lot of work experience or work learning that you think could earn you credential or, or could earn you credits? Or, do you know enough to earn credits before you come, or something like that, and that, that they could click on that and it'll take them out to the dashboard. It doesn't require any space on any of your servers or anything like that. It's independent. It's a, a website, essentially. And what do is they enter some information? It's not a huge amount of information, but it's essentially, you know, are you, where have you been, what have you done, what credentials do you have, have you taken any of those standardized tests, what were your scores, um, do you have a, you know, do you hold an apprenticeship card? Any of the things that we get into that matrix that, you know, did you work for Whitmix and Fort Collins? Any of these things that we will have attached to the matrix information, we ask them these questions. And then we need to link their information to that and create, um, really it's an account for them. They have, to, they have to open an account in order to use it. It's all it is is an email. There's no um, personal information in there that's saved. They're not asked for any um, identifiers. They put in a, their name in an email so that they can access it again as they choose. It'll be an account for them. It's safe for them for updates if they add things to it. There's an opportunity when they're done to print a report from it that they can bring with them to an advisor. And they can also share it via email with an advisor. Um, we'll also have then on that on the content management system, there's going to be an administrator portal. You can go, you can access the matrix information yourself. So if an advisor says, you know, they've got someone sitting in front of them who says, I have this NIM certificate, is it worth anything? They can go in there, type in NIM certificate, and they'll see what it's worth. So what we're after here is that every advisor will have a depth of information that they haven't had before at their fingertips, and they're not going to have to memorize all of this stuff. The student is going to walk in with what would essentially be the first 20 minutes of your advising session already done. They're going to hand you a report, or they're going to send it to you via email when they make an appointment to see you. It says, here's what I've done, here's what I know. The report says to them, in essence, you be eligible for credit in this based on this credential tells them to gather the credentials that they have, the transcripts, the gather the credentials for testing, to bring them with them to an advising session. Um, and essentially what we need from all of you for that, the one thing we need from all of you for that right away, and I'll send out an email to ask for this, is that you name a person or a destination an email where you want those requests for appointments or requests for advising to, co to go to. The student at the end of filling out this whole thing gets an opportunity. The report pops up. It says, here's what's, what's going on. They are required to choose a college. They have to choose one of your institutions because they're going to need to talk to an advisor if they want this to happen for them anyway. So this is the, the college. And then when they do that, they are offered an opportunity to both print 
and or to click and to send an email. The email is generated with the report as an attachment, and they say, I'd like an appointment to talk with you about my opportunities for PLA, and then you follow up with them. So our in this is that the information is centralized, the information is easy to access, that it can consistently and constantly update it because we're going we're gonna to have it live with the system, have it be a, a live um, document, and then, so then that um, all of you have um, less work and more efficiencies attached to advising students well in TLA. We're soft launch that in December. In other words, we're going to give it out to um, probably most of you, many of you, to check in to see what you think, to start to um, to see what we, we see about glitches or anything that we need to fix in the design or anything like that. And then um, we'll push it out harder to the public um, starting in January or starting in early January. Um, and really, if everything goes well, just in early December, we'll just go ahead and get it opened up and get your marketing people to go ahead and post it. But first, we want you to use it kind of without making it hugely public. We want you to look at it first and make sure that we've got it right. I'm very excited about this. I think it's going to be really helpful to a lot of people. So well, that's, that's um, going to be sent out to you at the end of the week here, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the manual has, I'm just going to the outline of it. So it starts with an introduction to prior learning assessment credit. We talk a lot about the standards for awarding PLA credit, and we followed the KL Standards Council on Adult and Experiential Learning, which is a national standard. Um, and really, a lot of what that has to do with is standardizing the assessment. We know that a person is um, being held to a, a, a good standard so that we can support. Every, every person that I have talked to who is a faculty member is concerned about rigor and what evaluation will look like, who's doing it, how is it being done. We don't want to dumb down a curriculum. We don't want to. Um, we want students coming into the classroom who aren't prepared for whatever the next step is. All of those standards are, are geared towards supporting that um, outcome. The, well, the approved PLA credit methods and procedures, and we have quite a lot in there that's really kind of nuts and bolts. So it'll be about um, for the registrars, what are the codes, how do you do them, although they've already gotten all of that information, but we'll have it in there. Um, it'll, there'll be, there's a portion in there for advisors. There's lots of different pieces and parts under the, uh, the methods and procedures. Then we'll look at the standardized tests. We talk about them. What are they? What are you looking for on a transcript? That kind of thing. Additional challenge exams. We'll talk about those and about um, all of those are going to have, or the, the institutional challenge exams and published guides. We'll also have instructions on forwarding information to um, CCCS for um, those things to be included in the matrix so that they can be um, more transparent. Published guides. Um, in, in that, we talk a lot about ACE. We talk about, um, we'll be talking about ACE military, the military guide. Um, the for military service members and veterans is a huge chunk, and there's people, um, especially at Pikes Peak, can tell you that it's a lot of work. And we're working on seeing how we can help to create some efficiencies there. Um, faculty evaluated local industry and workplace credit, I told you about. We'll look at folio assessment. Portfolios are not going to be included in the um, matrix, of course, because they're individualized. What we want to see out of those is how are you building portfolios? So, for instance, um, to standardize that somewhat, that if you have a, and I think some of you have already done this, if you have someone who wants to challenge an English 121 course, the departments typically have some kind of a portfolio template that they're using. But what we like to do is to get all departments to be thinking about what would that template look like so that they don't have to develop it every time someone walks through the door or so they can have a sense of a standard of these are the things I need to see that they could test against. And, and once again, to save a lot of time, the, the, the way that faculty are required to work on portfolios is excessive and it's inefficient. Um, the other thing that we are looking at is, is um, how faculty and students are um, working together on that. One of the suggestions that's going on um, everywhere nationally is that we all should or we should build an online portfolio assessment opportunity. And that's something that we can do, that we can look at. Um, so the college student, you know, you pay for one that you, to learn how to develop a portfolio, and then you develop that portfolio, and then they would have to pay for the cost of the assessment of the portfolio, which would be minimal. Um, but they have someone else guiding them in how to build it. That's one of those big time consumers for faculty. And what comes out of that is either they don't accept them or that they are not being necessarily with the outcomes that they would like to be able to help students more and it's not necessarily, um, they're necessarily able to be because of the, the resources. So we get that. Um, and minimum requirements for the content of a portfolio, and that's where I'm talking about a template. And we're looking at one, um, we're building one for um, the manufacturing group because it's a, a, attached to the CHAMP grant. And it says what that's looking at is what types of demonstrations 
considerations of skills you need to see, what credentials are out there that you want to see, what are the things that un, in that discipline that would make you believe that this person has um, the skills that you're looking for. We could do it for business, we could do it for um, lots of things. So that's really, uh, I'm a little vague around it because it's really about faculty making that decision. One of the things that if you look at your particular course, almost in the same way that you would do a challenge exam, what would be a portfolio template for that course that would be reasonable in your mind? Um, we're going to do a, um, we're going to have in the manual some information about training for the assessment, but we're also going to do some assessor training in the spring. Um, steps for using an outside, outside vendor, there's a, um, a number of different outside vendors that you can use um, for portfolio assessment. Learning counts through Kale is one of them. Students can send it out on their own. They can learn how to develop a portfolio. They can have one portfolio assessed um, and get a, a transcript for it, that kind of thing. Um, there's called the Department of Corrections information in there that's kind of, it's a little antiquated. I'm finding out that it really has a lot more to do with transfer, but it's always been in the PLA policy, so we left it there. And then a PLA credit appeals process, so if you do evaluate something and, and the student doesn't get the credit, that they have an opportunity to appeal. And this is another one of those ones where I'm hopeful that what we shift our thinking to and our culture to is that real um, learning should be assessed and awarded credit. And if there is a way for that person to show that learning that isn't necessarily typical or additional, but that they can demonstrate it, then we ought to be able to be open to that. How do we help a student show what they know so we can give them the credit that they deserve? And that's an important part of the conversation. Um, and it's a conversation. No one is going to be told how they should do that. We're asking people to open their minds to the idea that these students we better when we allow them to get credit for what they know and to start where they really should begin instead of having to backtrack. They save money, they save time. It also is a huge boost in self-efficacy. One of the things about the data that's showing us nationally and um, our own data sort of around it's a very small pool that we're working from, but uh, these students do better in, they do better in persistence, they stay longer, they earn more credit and they graduate at a higher rate than students who don't have prior learning assessment credit. And that's across all demographics, which really kind of the big to me is that um, uh, age, gender, um, race, anything that you can come up with, they're, they're um, showing these same outcomes across um, demographics. We can make a big difference for these students with this opportunity. Um, and there are a number of appendices, the crosswalk matrix on paper, because I think that people want to see that. Um, and we'll, we're going to make an effort to keep that updated. Again, the most updated one will be on the dashboard, but we'll keep working on that. Um, the PLA credit policy, the systems procedures, um, some of the work that we've looked at and the research that we've done for people to learn more about it, and then a glossary of terms. And so as the manual is concerned, here's the way this is going to work. I am going to be sending manual draft out to the field. It'll go to all of you who are in attendance because we have your emails on this. Um, on uh, the webinars, so today, tomorrow, and Friday, all of the people who attend will be sent a copy of the manual draft. And what we're asking for is to have, we're having it open for two weeks for comment period. I'm looking for editing, and I'll send out an email with, this, with uh, instructions, but we're not looking for editing. We're not looking for um, wordsmithing. We're asking you to take a look at the content and to decide if, it's, if what you need to see is there, if there's something missing. If there's anything there that's inaccurate and that needs to be fixed, and then we're going to leave it out for review through the 30th. We're going to pull it back, let the committee take a last pass at it, and then we're going to pass it forward to the le leadership who has to see it, which would be our legal and then up forward to the provost and um, Dr. McCallan. So that's the process. We hope to have it um, finished and ready to be published by the middle of December and then get up on our, we're going to have a new, um, we already have, we haven't opened it yet, but a, a prior learning assessment credit page that have all of this information and all of these documents available to all of you on, CC, on the CCCS site. So implementation, what's going on right now, that um, the PLA credit codes are already in place. We've been working over the summer. Um, Janelle Johnson um, worked with the registrars over the summer to um, create the new PLA codes. We shifted a lot of thinking around how those codes were there, primarily because what we had in the past was a few opportunities to just enter anything in fields, and what we ended up with was a little bit of mishmash of data, so it was difficult to follow how somebody earned a credential or how somebody earned credit. Um, we had a lot, of, um, a lot of text in there that we couldn't really look at in terms of, of um, you know, finding out if what we were doing was working well and that kind of thing. So we tightened up the coding 
so that we can get a better view, a clearer and better view of what's going on. Um, and that went out to registrars over the summer. Uh, the manual is work we're working on getting the manual published, and then the cost matrix will also be in the manual and finished. It has to go through the leadership of the colleges to make sure that they're okay with it. Um, and we're looking at, or what we're suggesting is that we work then on advising and let the advising folks get up to speed with all of this, that they're ready to work with the dashboard, that they um, are feeling confident about what they're getting out there, that it's giving them what they need. We start talking about um, some sessions, some, some recommendations on how they could conduct advising sessions for these students, how they can create some more of those efficiencies, and how to work with your registrars, um, transcript evaluators, whomever is doing the actual um, transcripting of credit to make sure that you're all on the same page and, and creating a good solid system at your institution. And looking at a marketing launch, all of the marketing departments in your colleges, all the communications folks, have already been through um, a presentation from me, and they've all been given a, a toolkit that we designed for them that gives them a whole bunch of information and um, pieces of you know, um, artifacts for them to use, including things for social networking, for their websites, for press releases, all of that stuff. And I may request out to them um, to hold all of that until you tell them that you're ready to go. I've been in your chair before and had people send things and say, hey, look at this new thing. And then um, we're all kind of like, what new thing? I never heard about it. And then you get inundated with people wanting that new thing. So we're, we're working hard to not let that happen to you at this point. So we need to plan. You need to plan a marketing launch. It's your choice. Your people have all the information, and they're going to be ready to go. I know a couple have already built out the block they're going to put on the website and that kind of thing. So you're in touch with your communications folks, and I would suggest that advising probably be the, the first place. Advising and registrars together are going to be the hardest hit by this if you start getting students who are interested. So to them about when do you want this to go out to the general public so that you'll be ready for when they start coming and plan. And then we're going to be doing in the spring a portfolio evaluation um, training for faculty. We have slots for about 75 faculty that we will pay um, for, that we're paying for the training. To have them, um, we'll do it regionally, I believe. We still haven't finished with the logistics, but, but WEFTER is like a train-the-trainer model. So you can and you'll get the official CALE evaluator um, training, and then you can then, or whomever takes advantage of that could then train other faculty to do the same thing. Um, the outcome for that would be that we start to standardize more the way that we're assessing portfolios and helping students develop them. And then also, anyone who takes that training will be able to do um, content evaluation, subject matter evaluations, scale through their Learning Counts program and could maybe make a little bit of extra money in doing that. They pay faculty in subject um, areas to um, assess portfolios that students create on Learning Counts. And so that might be a little extra incentive for people to be involved in this. And be working forward on the matrix just continuously. And what we're after with that is that any time that then does that crosswalking process that they then let us know that they've done it, that they give us some kind of indication, and we have a little form that we're putting together, and we'll get it into the matrix. It's not going to be a requirement because there's some sense that people are um, a little insecure about doing that. Some people are just like, well, we're not sure we want to. That's fine. What we're after is really doing what's best for students and creating efficiencies for our peers. So if you've done it and you want to share it, that's going to be the best, the best. Um, hopefully, people will want to do that. So the implementation plan. We're going to be looking at gathering metrics. So currently, we have a baseline report that's in the editing process now to show us what's been going on in the system. For We picked a time frame to try to get a, a lack of effect from the work that we've been doing in the last year and a half. So it's 2008 to 2000, or 2007 to 2000, through, through 2010. Um, we wanted to see what we had been doing in terms of our habits and how we were transcripting credit. And then we're going to use that as a baseline and um, move forward from there. We emulated the um, report from Gale called Fueling a Race, uh, Post-Secondary Success. If you're interested in looking at national data about um, PLA, that, that's a great source. So we, we mirrored that so that we can um, compare ourselves to the nation. We're going to get activity by demographics, credit courses, uh, credits by course, credit by method, persist year to year, completion of certificates, degrees, transfers, and then we're going to be doing a, quite a bit of qualitative survey to find out about how this system is working, whether it's working, what needs to change, what's better, what's worse, all of that stuff. 
in the year one, year two post implementation comparison reports from our third party evaluated that hopefully they're going to give us some good sense of what we've done and where we're going. And so then the next steps for all of you is that I'm um, conducting three different Q&A sessions and what they're going to be like is about 10 minutes worth of talking, if that. And the rest of it is going to be taking questions and talking. Um, they're, you know, more focused on the things that you would be most interested in hearing about. So at 8 o'clock on Friday we'll do one for, um, I just call it registration, so admissions, registration, transcript evaluators, anyone who's dealing with the kind of nuts and bolts of transcripting the credit. Then advising at 11.30, advisors, testing centers, financial aid, academic support, anyone who's in that particular arena. Instruction at 2 o'clock, faculty, instructional leadership, anybody who would like to be involved in that one. And all we're doing is Q&A. And it may not be that there's a lot of A. There might, <laughs> it may be that some of what you're asking is questions that we just need to work on getting the answers to. And that's part of my reasoning around this is that we get this out and talk about it. And, and you know, the MIDI was, I think, a very good, broad representation of all of you. But there's always someone who says, well, have you thought about this thing? And we might be able to say, well, you know, we haven't, so we'll, we'll do that. So it, it's part of, um, at this stage of the, of the process, getting you guys involved, helping you to feel more confident and more comfortable about this. Really, we're, we're very hopeful that this is going to be a wonderful thing for your institutions and for students. One of the things that's true, and you'll see it in the data if you go out and look at that um, report in Kale, and it's coming, you know, it's, it's showing up in our data as well. This is a really powerful recruitment tool for students. Students come to our colleges who would not come otherwise. And that's been a big part of the data that's being gathered around the country. Um, SUNY New York, uh, SUNY uh, Real is one of the places that's doing it, a couple other Empire State. Um, who are looking at this and saying, would you have come to school if you didn't have PLA credit? And what they're finding is the students is probably not, that I didn't think that I could be a college student. So there's students who would come otherwise. The students who do come are earning more credits. Um, this sense of, well, we're going to be losing credits because they're not taking the classes with us. And actually, the data shows just the opposite, that they actually stay longer and earn more credits, and they graduate at a higher rate, and which is really a lot of what we're after. On Monday the 16th, I'm going to be sending out an email to anyone who was registered. There'll be a link for the recordings to these sessions that you can share if you want to. Draft the manual with instructions on what um, information we'd like back and how you can respond. Um, copies of the policy and the system procedures. I'm, I'm, I'll put a, a maybe on the system procedures just to make sure that it's gone through the, the process it has to. If it hasn't, it won't be there, but if it has, it'll be there. Um, the PLA credit manual um, comment period is November 16th to the 30th, and the publishing, my intention is to kind of push it through before we leave for Christmas break so that it's out there for you when you come back in January. So that is the extent of my stuff. We still have about eight minutes left. So if you think that you have a question or if you would like to ask a question, we can take them for just a little bit. And I'm going to encourage you that if you have a question to ask, ask it, put it in chat, I, if I, and I don't get to it, that we will um, <clears throat> for sure talk about it on Friday. Or if you want to email me any question that you have, if you'd rather not do it online like this, just send it to me. I'm at bitsy, B-I-T-S-Y dot cones, C-O-H-N, at ccs dot edu. I'm going to pile all of these and put together, try to put together an FAQ. Um, and hopefully that will help as well and we can sh share it out. You know, the, the, the point of all of this and all of the pushing out is to get this information out to everybody, to have an opportunity to talk about it and make sure that it's really going to be a positive um, a for all of you and that also um, for, for your students that you can feel excited about it because we think it's a really good thing. Any questions at all? Okay, so here's one. Whoops, there's a lot of them coming in. Let me see. Let me start at the top here. First come, first serve. Okay. Um, portfolio assessment training slots be catered to faculty by discipline or by college. We haven't looked at that yet. The last time that I did something like this, I sent it out to the VPs and asked for recommendations. Um, and really, uh, you know, I, I kind of go in a lot of different directions. We have people who want to volunteer, and then we have people who um, – who are recommended, um, so I haven't really, um, we haven't really pinned that down yet. I think that um, most likely what we'll do is have a certain number of slots for each, each institution and maybe call a couple for, um, you know, there's a, the institutions, a particular institutions who might want to add on. So that's, it's been done yet, but we'll be working on that. Do institutes have to accept credit now that may have been transcripted by a previous institution or will be active at a later date? High school agreements where one college transcripts but students taking the credit to another institution. 
Right now, um, that policy has been in place since February, and now that we're doing all this informational rollout, I would say, yes, you need to be taking it now. Um, and this is one of those things that we'll talk about with the registrars to see if um, we're going to run into any problems in terms of how you're transcripting this. But yes, the, they, um, the policy has been in place and approved by the board since February, so you can go ahead and take those credits. I uh, expect that there'll be some conversation about that. This is one of those things that we we stand on our we we look at and we stand on our evaluations. Um, give credit for those things that are co that's college credit and it's accepted any other college. Thinking around that is that if what pops is some kind of controversy around that, then we need to facilitate the faculty together to talk about it. What what's new? What needs to be there? What needs to be different? Um, that will be helpful in sorting out that um, if, if there are any controversies around that. But if you're transcripting something in CCNS credit, then that transfers to any college. Any questions? What role is CTE industry advisory boards in approving local industry and workplace crosswalks? That would be your your institutions. A lot of that, um, actually, that entire process is local. So if you um, want that to be part of the um, your assessment, you know, if you want to build an assessment pathway, it says that, you know, one of the things that has to happen is that we run that um, evaluation by our CT advisory boards for approval. That's entirely up to you. Um, would be a good thing to do to help, help support your efforts. Um, some of you have stronger connections than others to certain types of industries. Some of this might have already been done, and you just don't have it documented where we can document it. I think it's already been done a lot in CTE, but um, yeah, that would be a very good idea to get your advisory boards involved and to um, support this opportunity. One thing to know is that um, I've talked to an employee here who um, was very interested in having this done for her folks who um, she would like to see them for their education, but they don't have the time and she doesn't have the resources to pay for them to take all of the courses that they might take and especially those that are repetitive. So she asked if we could come in and do some evaluation of her workplace and her training. Um, she has that whole level one, two, three thing on and she has um, a lot of stuff in place. So could we take a look at that and um, say that if one of her guys is at a level three, that he would come in with a certain number of credits. Very interested in that industry, very interested in this as a way to incentivize their, their um, workers getting more education, but also as a way to reduce the cost to them of paying for the education. Especially small businesses are much vested in, yeah, we'll get a, we'll get somebody in there if they can start with, you know, turn it toward a, an associate's degree. Very excited about that idea. Got one or two more minutes. Any other questions? No. I'm hoping that um, if you haven't already, that you will take advantage of signing up for one of the Q&A sessions and to be thinking about questions and to maybe to your peers and to have some of those ready when you come into that forum, or um, to free to send them to me. Um, I, I um, like I gather questions into an FAQ, and some people, you know, they answer the question, but they don't ask, and you know, it's just like the other room. One person might ask the question, and 20 people might need the answer. So feel free, and uh, I'll make sure that you um, get some responses. And if something I don't know the answer to or we haven't talked about yet, then we'll definitely do that. It's the thing I want to make sure that um, we're trying to make this a process where we're hitting all the notes, if we can. I don't think it's possible to hit everyone. So stuff's going to go wrong. Stuff's going to be not ideal, but um, I'm hoping that we can really make a good effort at getting it in good shape. So here's another one. If PLA credit is included in a FCA, will faculty at four-year colleges end up to what workplace crosswalks will be approved? It'll be one of those conversations. Um, as far as which majors the students are working towards, which industry, that kind of thing. Until, and this is, you know, again, CDHE has got it on their table to be creating a policy that says that, that four-year institutions will accept credit, prior assessment credit, no matter how it was earned. So that'd be our evaluation. We decide they get the credit. We give them the credit. The credit goes. Um, right now, it's a matter of really building relationships with those institutions and saying, you know, for instance, we have articulations into pre-engineering at MS you that could easily, um, students could easily come in and earn PLA credit for some of those things and say to MSU, are you okay with this being, um, this articulated credit is, could be putting an assessment credit. They're fine with it as long as it's assessed properly. But that's an individual relationship.
relationship, it's a departmental relationship, so it's difficult, it's more time consuming to have to do it that way, but it benefits the student if we have those conversations um, with our four-year partners to say, here's something that we're doing, here's the way this works, here's how we're evaluating it, here's the system we're using, build trust, and to say, okay, that looks good, and put it in an articulation. That's what I said earlier, to, to put that statement in there in the articulation that, that the um, credit that has been earned, prior learning assessment, has been fully assessed and is, can, is deemed to be rigorous and equitable and all the other things that they're looking for. But having that conversation before the student walks in the door with a transcript is going to be helpful to the student. As far as um, standardized test types of their concern for any student, that's the one where right at the moment, as soon as they get that um, statewide matrix done, and they're not going to be stopped at the door on standardized tests anymore. It's a common practice for students to be stopped with CLEP tests until they showed what their score was, and that's not going to happen anymore. So in the interest of, of um, on the time commitment, it's just 12.30 now. Up, oh, it flipped to 12.31, so I'm going to close this out. If you have other questions or you have concerns, please feel free to send me an email. I'm going to, I'm going to um, do much to get those answered quickly, and um, you will see the documents that I told you about and all the other, and the next request for help. Monday the 16th. Well, thank you all very much for your time, and I hope that this was helpful to you in terms of um, getting information you need to get going. So thank you all very much.